You call us anti-Semites? How arrogant are you? There are some Semites in Africa. There are Semites, the Arabs. Are you trying to make the world think that you're the only Semites in the world? You're anti-Semitic. Look at what you're doing to the Arab people, to the Palestinian people. You have dispossessed them, disinherited them. They are now disenfranchised. Get hot, get dissed. <laughs> By you. Yes, sir. You've driven them like vagabonds from their home. They are Semitic people. And you are anti-Semitic. I really want to state here for the press and for the world that I denounce anti-Semitism in all its forms and manifestations. I denounce racism in all its forms and manifestations. If I believed that I were an anti-Semite, meaning somebody who hates somebody else simply because of their faith, I would be unfit to call myself a servant of God or a member of the righteous. I am not now, nor have I ever been anti-Semitic. Now, what is the definition, the true definition of that word? Well, we know that anti means against. And Semite is referring to those persons who originated in the Middle Eastern area of the world that have a base in African, Asian language and culture. Among these are Jews or Hebrews, Arabs, the Phoenician, all of that group in them. The languages are Aramaic, Hebrew, Arabic, and one or two more. These are the Semitic people. Now, the ADL has narrowed that definition to mean exclusively anti-Jewish. Now, to be a Jew, is it a race or is it a faith? But there are those who see it as a national identity that is not, that not, does not have anything to do with faith. Now, in Israel today, there are several kinds of Jews. There are the Falasha Jews, the Sephardic Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, all of whom are bound by the common denominator of faith. But race has come in there to play a negative role because the Sephardic Jews and the Falasha Jews are not really, really equal in sharing power in Israel. So now when you talk about anti-Semitic, according to the definition, if I were against that body of people, I might find myself against myself. So now I must ask the question, why do they use that term? For what purpose? The ADL and other Zionists use the term to stifle legitimate criticism of Zionism and the state of Israel and the Zionist policies of the state of Israel. They also use that term to stifle legitimate criticism of the errant behavior of Jewish people 
vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the non-Jewish population of the world. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong, and they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which it's okay. They are talented people, and they have power, money, and uh, media, and other things. And their attitude is, Israel, my country, right or wrong, the identification. And they are not ready to hear criticism. And it's very easy to blame people who criticize certain acts of the Israeli government as anti-Semitics and to bring up the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people and that's, that justify everything we do to the Palestinians. This is not right. The Jews cannot be held above criticism and this is why many of us are suffering from a false charge. Right, right. Anti Semitism. Now, whenever the ADL and the Zionists feel that somebody is not bowing to their will, they drop that on them. Anti-Semite. I, I like to see us lay to rest this whole notion of anti-Semitism. The one thing that is an incorrect, incorrect statement. Because the whole idea of a Semite, Semites were people who lived in southwestern Asia, including northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, who spoke Ugaritic, who spoke Jeez, who spoke Ethiopic, spoke Hebrew, who, 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 who right. spoke Arabic. Right. Those are our people. We are a Semitic people. Therefore, we cannot be anti-Semitic. Ashkenazic Jews are calling us anti-Semitic. We cannot be anti-Semitic because we are the descendants of a Semitic people. Let's lay that to rest. That was a weapon in the hands of the Jews since 1870. They used it against other people, but it doesn't work against Beautiful. people in Northeast Africa. Thank you. He said, where should they go? Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have to go anywhere, really, because they weren't being persecuted anymore, but they were taking other people's land. The, you're talking about the Israelis? Of course. Uh -huh. uh, do you consider yourself anti-Semitic? Hell no. You do not? I'm a Semite. You're a Semite yourself? Of Arab background. Well, I know you're Lebanese background, mm -hmm. right? But you're not Jewish. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, no, you say you're... I'm just trying to clarify. They're not Semites. I mean, they're, most of them are from Europe. Mm -hmm. The Jews? Yes. For centuries, Jews around the world have been lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem and their temple, which they believe was the beginning of their long 2,000 years of exile. Exile. You know, I was educated, not in a Jewish school in London. I passed all my years in Israel. The fact that the Jews were expelled from, from the land of Israel was the basic of my thinking about our collective identity. You understand? It's all so deep. I remember the day that I read a little, very short article of somebody that say, no, the exile didn't happen. And I remember running to the, to the library of our university that uh, has a lot and a lot of books about the history of Jews, really. And I was looking for one book, one research book about the, the act of the exile. And I remember I didn't find any book how the Jews were expelled from Georgia, from Palestine. I didn't find even one book. I remember the same day running to a few of colleagues that are occupying with, uh, you know, with ancient history and asked them, I'm shocked, the exile didn't happen. And they say, told me, we never wrote that the exile happened. And I said, come out to the corridor, ask the, all the students. Everybody knows that the Jews were expelled from Judea 2,000 years ago. Yes, but it's not us. <laughs> and then I started to understand what is nationalism, 
and what is the technology of diffusing historical consciousness. התפיסה הכוללת היא שבעקבות המרד, מרד החורבן, חורבן המקדש בירושלים, יש לה הגליה של אנשים, והנה אנחנו מתחילים בגלות ארוכה שמי יודע מתי תגיע לסיומה. ההפך הוא הנכון. השלטון בא וה... והדת באה, אבל האנשים הם אותם אנשים. ואותם אנשים, הוא אומר. הם בעצם היו יהודים שהתאסלמו לפני 1,300 שנה. Nowhere in his writings does Josephus mention the forced expulsion of the Jews from either Jerusalem or the rest of the Roman province. So why is it that exile has been historically perceived as a fact? הדימוי ההיסטורי הרווח הוא הדימוי שהיהודים גורשו מארצם. והתמונה הזאת היא תמונה שהיא פשוט לא נכונה מבחינה היסטורית. הרומאים לא נקטו במדיניות של הגליה של עמים. זה דימוי מקראי שמבוסס על המסופר, על הגליית הבבליים, ועוד לפני כן האשורים, אבל הוא לא היה מדיניות של הרומאים. הרומאים השאירו עמים במקומם. ותבעו מהם לסור למרות רומי. There are many missing pieces in the story of this village of both Jewish and Arab heritage. But the only clear evidence of an actual exile is that of Suleiman and the 5,000 other Palestinians in 1948. Is it possible that some of these refugees are distant descendants of the Jewish population of Sephoris who were never exiled. You know, go on believing your myths, but at least understand what you're doing by doing that. Uh, if I'm correct in your book that many of the, the Palestinians who were, uh, who were there in, on the land were actually converted from Judaism as well. Not only this, it's not me, you know, the, a lot of people criticize me that I pretend that Palestinians are the real Jew. Not at all. It's David Ben-Gurion and others, first Zionists, that when they arrived to Palestine, they were sure that the peasant, the Arab peasant in place, are the descendant of the ancient Hebrew. It's not Shlomo Sand. It's mm -hmm. David Ben-Gurion that till the 20, 1929 believed that the Arab peasant are the descendant of the ancient Hebrew. And they were converted from Judaism to Islam in the seventh century after Jesus Christ. It's not me that uh, right. you know, put it forward. And I believe that Ben-Gurion was more or less right. I mean, I don't believe that uh, the Palestinians today are the, the direct the descendant of the ancient Hebrew. They are mixed like every other people. But the chance that a member of Hamas in Hebron will be a descendant of the ancient Hebrew, ancient Jew, is much more greater than my, my affiliation to this. You are saying that most of the Jews are actually not Semites? I mean, um, I, I don't know. If you could please just fill, uh, fill us in about this. Um, if I read it correctly, maybe I misread it. Professor, the Semitic history of, uh, if, of Israelis or Jews in Israel... Yeah. Go ahead. No, I don't think, think that Israel, uh, the Jewish are Semitic. I, you, we can start with s something that I mentioned before. The exile of the Jew in the first century of our era didn't happen. There is not any uh, scientific uh, research book about the exile. You know, it's a myth, the exile of the Jew, and I think that most of the Jew in the world came from conversion, massive conversion, from the beginning of the first century till the 18th century. Jewishness was the first proselyte monotheism and most of the Jew are descendant of conversion and not of racist uh, descendant from the ancient Hebrew. Uh, yes, the Jewish are not Semitic. Most of them are not Semitic. This one is from Ari. The question is, how do European implants consider themselves Semites? 
And what about the irony that people defend Semites as Jews, but not the Arabs that came before them? I'm just going to say real quick, I'll let you guys answer this, but I'm looking at the three of us and I'm looking at Jamil and who of us who among us looks like they're Semite? Like they come from a Semitic region, you know what I mean? I mean, we're like, we're these European, white Europeans. I don't think there's a Semitic gene in our gene pool. And we're the ones to talk about anti-Semitism. I just thought that was funny. But go ahead, gentlemen, please. Yeah, see, words change. Uh, the word anti-Semite today is used in regard to Jews, even though the original um, word Semite means people of Semitic origin. And by the way, the reason why it was applied to Jews in the late 19th century was in order to change the Jews into a racial category. They wanted the Jews, this is, it was an anti-Semitic thing to call the Jews Semites because they wanted to perceive the, Jew, the Jews to be perceived as a specific race, which later uh, developed into Nazi racial uh, doctrine and anti-Semitism. So the short answer is that's how the word is used today. Nobody claims to be a Semite. They claim the word Semite changed. And technically the reason why it was applied to Jews is actually for anti-Judaic reasons. The idea being that British Jews were not British, French Jews were not French, German Jews not German. And this is something, therefore, that Zionism has in common with anti-Semites and racists. You see, for me, a British Jew is the same as a British Catholic, a British Protestant, a British Seventh-day Adventist. Their religion has nothing to do with the fact that they are or are not British. The racists don't believe that. The anti-Semites don't believe that. Even the fascists later didn't believe that. But also the Zionists didn't believe that. They believed that a French Jew was not French and should leave France and should go and live somewhere else, either Uganda or Patagonia or the Seychelles or, as it turned out, Palestine. This is, I think, the other side of the coin of the anti-Semite racists. Despite the overwhelming opposition of most German Jews, it was the Zionist Federation of Germany that was the only Jewish group, and it was a minority group, that supported the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, as they agreed with the Nazis that Jews and Aryans were separate and separable races. This was not a tactical support, but one based on ideological similitude. What Israel and its American and European allies have sought to do in the last six and a half decades is to convince Palestinians that they too must become anti-Semites and believe as the Nazis, Israel, and its Western anti-Semitic allies do that Jews are a race that is different from European races, that Palestine is their country, and that Israel speaks for all Jews. In order to define a Jew, if, if that means you have to find a characteristic that all Jews have, and if you have that characteristic, you're a Jew, and there is no such thing. It is not cultural because Ivanka Trump and an Ethiopian Jew does not have the same culture. It's not a race. We have Jews of all races. It's, it's nothing. There is nothing in common except according to what the Jewish law defines a Jew as. But there is no definition. Jabotinsky said the Jews are a race, but that's ridiculous. So they asked him, what about the Sephardic Jews? He says, oh, they're not Jews, they're Negroes. And that wasn't Jabotinsky, I'm sorry, Jabotinsky said Jews are a race, and Moses Hess did as well. They asked uh, 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 Solomon, a uh, uh, Hebrew University biologist, what about the, uh, the um, Sephardic Jews? He says, no, they're Negroes. They have an elongated skull, they're Arab half-castes. So they're not really Jews. Um, because if a Jew is a race, it has to be the same race. If a Jew is a culture, it has to be the same culture. If a Jew is food and chicken soup, that means if you have a Chinese guy that eats chicken soup, now he becomes Jewish. Or if I stop eating sick chicken soup, I'm not. They have tried to define themselves in different ways, but none of these ways have been intellectually sustainable. That's my claim. There is a common DNA for the Jewish in the world or not? Look on the Jews, huh? The anti-Semitic were right saying that it is a kind of people race. It's not a joke. In my university, people are looking without a lot of success for Jewish DNA because it's so difficult to define a secular Jew. Hitler had no problem defining a Jew. He had a problem. 
Hitler had a very big problem. You know, he based himself to define the Jewish people as a race, as a biological phenomenon. But you know the criteria, the parameter to define who is a Jew was bureaucratic uh, papyrus, I mean papers. He cannot find biologically who is a Jew and who is not a Jew. He had a real problem to define what is a Jew. That he killed a six million Jews. By what? By what? This is one of the paradox of the Nazism, the stupidity of the Nazism. Why? Because they defined racically a Jew, but they cannot prove who is Jew by race. You understand what the problem? They look for papers, birth uh, act, birth act of your grandmother. But it's a bear act, it's a bureaucratic stamp, you understand me? He cannot define who is a Jew. He cannot look forward, take a Jew, and decide that he is Jew because of biological terms. They try to measure the, uh, the heads, you, you know, to look forward with the, with the noise and all this. They couldn't arrive to define who is a Jew. Israel and its anti-Semitic allies affirm that Israel is the Jewish people, that its policies are Jewish policies, that its achievements are Jewish achievements, that its crimes are Jewish crimes, and that therefore anyone who dares to criticize Israel is criticizing Jews and must be anti-Semitic. For the last few decades in America, right-wing pundits, politicians, and Christian leadership have changed the conversation around what constitutes anti-Semitism and shifted the definition from bashing Jews to bashing Israel. Anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic protests. Anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic cesspool. Today, anti-Semitism hides behind the label of anti-Israel. The new anti-Semitism. The weird thing about conflating Jew and Israel is that it's actually constantly being perpetuated by American conservatives, evangelical Christians, and Israeli politicians, usually in the same sentence. The lifelong friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Pro-Israel, pro-Jewish. The Jewish people and the Jewish state. Israel and to the Jewish people. State of Israel or the Jewish people themselves, Israel and, and the Jewish people specifically. By making support of Israel synonymous with support of Jews, they're also making opposition to Israel look like opposition to Jews. Because it's being, it became politicized, not only did the term anti-Semite you know, anti become politicized to include anybody who does not follow the Zionist narrative, but now they actually changed the, the, the definition of what anti-Semitism is. They created a new definition, which includes um, what we do. So in other words, now all of us are anti-Semitic as well because we do not fall under that. President Donald Trump's executive order combating anti-Semitism of December 2019 adopted the IRA definition for all U.S. executive agencies. President Donald Trump has regularly boasted of his pro-Israel record. And we will send a clear signal that there is no daylight between America and our most reliable ally, the state of Israel. I love the people in this room. I love Israel. I love Israel. I've been with Israel so long in terms of I've received some of my greatest honors from Israel. My father before me, incredible. I'm a newcomer to politics but not to backing the Jewish state. I will meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu immediately. I have known him for many years. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. In spring of 2004, at the height of the violence in the Gaza Strip, I was the Grand Marshal of the 40th Salute to Israel Parade, the largest single gathering in support of the Jewish state. We love Israel. We will fight for Israel 100%, 1,000%. It will be there forever. Israel, a force for justice and peace. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. This was a special token of affection given by myself and the First Lady to uh, Prime Minister and the First Lady of Israel. And it's a uh, key. Uh, we call it a key to the White House. And it's a key to our country and to our hearts. He did it again as he signed a new executive order, this time aimed at fighting what the White House sees 
as a growing problem of anti-Semitism on university campuses across the U.S. This is our message to universities. If you want to accept the tremendous amount of federal dollars that you get every year, you must reject anti-Semitism. It's very simple. The new order could significantly impact the BDS movement. It urges a boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign against the Israeli government for its treatment of Palestinians living in the region. Some have claimed BDS is anti-Semitic, while supporters say it's not targeting a religion, but political action. And ultimately, what this executive order is about, it expands the definition of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel. And the risk here is that students on college campuses who are simply engaged in pro-Palestine advocacy for human rights um, could get into serious trouble simply because um, their criticism of Israel can now be construed as anti-Semitism. This, by the way, is blatantly unconstitutional. It's a violation of free speech, which is one of the most fundamentally cherished um, values in, in American life. Uh, so th this has been an absolute disaster. And this executive order being signed today, it is a game changer. It will go down in history. Thank you, Mr. President. You did a great, great job. The people who helped you do this did a great, great job. And you will be remembered by history for all time for having signed this very important order. Jared Kushner, the Jewish shadowy senior advisor to the president, has cooked up an executive order which expands the definition of anti-Semitism, expands the definition of Judaism, so that they can weaponize the federal government against college campuses to crush Palestinians on university campuses. Well, you know, if you have a problem with that, you must just be an anti-Semite. You just might be a Jew hater, right? If you find anything wrong with that, if you find anything troubling about that, or even suspect or conspicuous, you might just hate Jewish people. Got a problem with Jewish people? That law says you have to sign an oath pledging that you do not and will not boycott the Israeli government. This law was nearly identical to laws passed in over 20 other states. All of these laws are designed to punish people who participate in the boycott of the Israeli government over its human rights abuses against the Palestinian people, and also to coerce others into not joining the boycott. Now, even though this law passed in Georgia back in 2016, people spoke up against it. Civil rights groups obviously did, and so did prominent members of our state legislature, including then House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams. They noted what we know today, that this law is blatantly and hilariously unconstitutional. Every American has the right to engage in boycotts. This is constitutional law one-on-one. -on -one. Imagine if during the civil rights movement, the state of Alabama passed a law saying, if you want to work for our state, you cannot participate in the Montgomery bus boycott. Imagine if during the fight against apartheid in South Africa, uh, states passed laws saying, if you want to work for us, you cannot boycott the South African apartheid government. Those laws would have been irrational, illegal, and unconstitutional, and so is Georgia's law. So far, 26 states have passed anti-BDS laws, which force anyone who does business with the government to pledge not to participate in the movement. State contractors have to sign a loyalty pledge to Israel. Could you explain to me from the beginning so How that happened. One of our biggest advertisers and oldest advertisers is uh, uh, University of Arkansas uh, Plasky Technical College. And so in November, the marketing people who we worked with for years said, you know, this the purchasing director is requiring us to get you to sign this. And, you know, at first I just sort of lost it. And, uh, but this time it just kept coming. And finally I said, well, there's not going to be a signed pledge. See if I can find it. The college buys ads in his paper with state money, making Leverett a state contractor. You refused to sign it? Yeah. And what did that cost you? Well, so far about $15,000. And uh, it could get worse. There are other states that have sponsored bills like this, and they're strikingly similar, almost word for word, <laughs> like Texas, Louisiana. And I'm wondering, basically, who's behind authoring these bills? No one came and pursued me to author this bill. I like to check with groups like IPAC, see what their thoughts are, and if they've got any uh, what, we, what we call template legislation that seems to be working for them. APEC, the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, 
is a powerful lobbying group that pushes pro-Israel policies in U.S. politics. I think as a state, we, we felt like we had the right to, to make a statement as well. But you're not sanctioning another country. You're sanctioning your own citizens. Right, uh, we are. We're, we're, we're sending a message that says, hey, we, we are not going to stand by in Arkansas and let people take our taxpayer money against something that our overwhelmingly amount of our taxpayers don't believe in. You can choose to boycott Israel and, and be in Arkansas. We're not taking away your First Amendment freedom of expression at all. Just we're not going to do business with you at that point. They're saying you got the freedom. You don't have to sign it. Yeah, we just but, don't. But, but yeah. if, you, if, if you choose not to sign it, you just can't do business with us. Yeah, That's well, all. I'll tell you what. I'm a citizen, okay? I pay taxes in this state. And, I, and I, this is my home. And no, they do not have a right to punish me for exercising my constitutional right to be silent in this, in this instance, it's just to be silent. We don't take a position on this. Our job is to write about Arkansas. We're a lot more interested in Medicaid expansion here in Arkansas than we are what's going on in Jerusalem. Is there a tipping point where you recognize if you don't sign these pro-Israel pledges that your publication is gonna sink? Could be. And would you be willing to sign it then? I don't know. Did your Christian faith have an influence on the authorship of this bill or the sponsorship of this bill? Yeah, I, I think it absolutely did. Uh, and I'm a believer in the Bible, so I absolutely believe the Jewish people are God's chosen people, and therefore I have a responsibility to benefit them where, where possible. Zionism is the belief that Jewish people should have their own nation. The movement gathered support through the early 20th century, and the State of Israel was established in 1948 in Palestine. Right from the start, Haredi Jews, known as ultra-Orthodox, voiced their opposition. Not only did they fear the rise of secularism, they also believed Jewish people shouldn't have their own state before the coming of the Messiah. Over time, some ultra-Orthodox groups softened their attitudes and they began to enjoy the benefits of Israel. Others have maintained their opposition. Israel is not the Jews, and I believe that the best thing for everybody involved, including the Middle East conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, is to eliminate this false Jewish element of the conflict. Zionism is a political ideology. Most Zionists are not Jews. Many Jews are not Zionists, either for religious reasons or political reasons. You know, I used to say early on when I was a kid, I'd say when I was a young senator, I'd say, if I were a Jew, I'd be a Zionist. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. And my father pointed out to me, I did not need to be a Jew to be a Zionist, for I am. Israel needs to become a normal country, the country of its citizens, the country of Israelis. Any connection between Israel and Jews, that's the real problem over here. Israel is, describes itself as being a Jewish state, which by its very definition excludes me. And the, the state is founded on this concept of Jewish privilege, which means that when the, when the Supreme Court, this court that he lauds so much, has faced the question of whether Israel's a Jewish state or a democracy, it has always chosen Jewish state, which means that Jewish privilege exists. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic, it cannot be both. And it won't ever really be at peace. You proposed a law for the Knesset to pass against Arabs that's really astonishingly identical to the Nuremberg laws of the Nazis under Adolf Hitler. Mr. Wallace, one of the problems of Jews is that they wouldn't know a Jewish concept if they tripped over one. I merely quoted from the Talmud. All right, let, let's go to some specifics about the law that you propose. Kahana proposal, status of non-Jews. They have no national rights, no part in the political practices of the state of Israel. The Nazi law, Jews cannot be citizens of the Reich. They have no right to vote or hold a public position. And we see this through everything from the 60 laws that directly discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel to the way that people such as Ayalon and others uh, deal with Palestinians for everything from calling for our heads to be chopped off, for us to be drowned, uh, for oaths of loyalty. What they fail to recognize is that, that we didn't come to Israel, we didn't immigrate to Israel, Israel came to us. Everybody's busy fighting Israel about all, all the things that they do, their behavior. And, and, and 
let them. But that's like, you know, the story of the Wizard of Oz where this big wizard and every, everybody's busy fighting the smoke and mirrors. What we need to do is to just open the curtain and expose Zionism for the, for the, for the falsehood that it is. The Zionists have nothing to do with the Jews. They're just a random country. The propaganda is much worse than people think. I've studied Zionism from when I was in grade school, intensely. All of it, from beginning to end. Their history, their ideology, from a Jewish perspective, from a historical perspective. The propaganda is incredible. I'll give you an example. You're all subject to it. You walk into a department store in December, Macy's. You'll see the Christmas displays and the Hanukkah displays. The Christmas displays are always green, red, and gold, right? What color are always, invariably, the Hanukkah displays? Yeah, They're always white. blue and white. Blue and white. There is no connection between blue and white and the holiday of Hanukkah at all. That is merely the Israeli flag. That is a, a um, subliminal way of teaching everybody that Jewishness, Judaism, Hanukkah, the Maccabees, have something to do with Israel. The propaganda is amazing. It's all over. It's subliminal. It exists on all levels. What we need to do is to, to free our minds of the connection between Israel and Jews. So let me, let me try and get your position clear on this. What you're saying is that the existence of Israel is somehow against your religion. The Jewish religion forbid since the destruction of the temple 2,000 years ago, we were given an edict, a decree by God, uh, it's a prophecy of King Solomon, that we are not to attempt to recreate our sovereignty, even one inch of Jewish sovereignty. But we have to stand up. It is critical. It is our responsibility as Jews to stand up and speak out. My voice is in God's help the voice of my brothers and sisters of Jerusalem, and we have many people who are children and some who actually left occupied Palestine. We are from around the world. Invariably, the very religious communities of Jews share this view. You will cross over right into Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the largest enclave of religious Jewry besides al Quds is that what Israeli flag? Because it is a God-fearing community, a God-fearing Jewish community. What is our message? That this problem, this magma, this tragedy, this catastrophe has been misdiagnosed. The wrong medication is being applied. It can cause death, and it is causing death. The problem isn't a religious conflict. The problem isn't that there is anti-Semitism. The problem is that there are people masquerading in our religion, in Judaism, in the Star of David, and claiming that the, the indigenous people of Quds, of Palestine, are victims, are villains, not victims. They're claiming they're evil, and they hate the Jews. How unacceptable, how revolting could that be? We were embraced since the time of the Inquisition and Crusades when we needed a home, the Muslim and Arab countries embraced us and we flourished for hundreds of years in the streets of Jerusalem. We lived in the same courtyards with the Arab brethren, babysitting each other's children, our most precious objects. But we had to go pray. And there was no human rights groups to protect us. It wasn't necessary because this is not a religious issue. Nothing, religion isn't an impediment that they're distinctly Muslim and we're Jewish. The problem is the occupation, a nationalism that started a mere hundred odd years ago called Zionism, an ideology that is masquerading in my religion. People who detest the godliness, who are not religious. I carry pictures of their meetings, of their declaration. Anybody can look it up, the Declaration of Independence of 1948, representing Judaism, and not one of them is covering their heads as a God-fearing Jew has to. What a farce. What did our chief rabbi say in 1947? 
and into the documents and pictures of the United Nations. He pleaded with the United Nations. Rabbi Dushinsky of best memory. I'm quoting him. This is United Nations document. Quote, we furthermore wish to express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. That is the whole truth. Judaism does not give us the permission to occupy in our covenant with God of 3,000 years. When Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, went on Mount Sinai, it says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Our Torah forbids us to occupy. And more than that, since the destruction of the temple, we were commanded by God not to create Jewish sovereignty, and that is why, why the Crusades, why the Inquisition, Jews never, never attempted to make Jewish sovereignty. We live there throughout the world as citizens, as loyal citizens, but never to create a state. This movement of occupation is a direct rebellion against God. And just in case you're questioning this, look how they treat the religious Jews. They brutally beat them daily. Every boy and girl who turns 17 is a criminal because we refuse to serve in their army. The pictures are there. The facts are there. They blocked us out of YouTube. Our site was blocked. Girls are arrested. Boys are arrested. For over 70 years. The deal of the century won't be when the people become aware of the truth, they should give respect to our rabbis, the great scholars and God-fearing people. We went through the Holocaust. Our parents and grandparents died in the Holocaust. And we remain with our religion true to God. And the deal of the century is to bring back the history of peace, of coexistence, of giving back the respect the lives to the Palestinian people, the freedom that God gives God to every human being that was created by God. And then as a Jew, we could do what is obligated to show our thankfulness and gratitude for when we embraced throughout history, when we were being burnt at the stake for not converting out of Judaism. That is our requirement. My brothers and sisters in Jerusalem are constantly calling us and saying, are you conveying this message? How we're being beaten? How we are crying and humiliated for what is happening to the Palestinian people? We have thousands of people on the streets demonstrating daily. This week, I had a guest in my house, a rabbi from Jerusalem. While he was in my house, the Zionist soldiers went into Meir Sharim, one of the oldest Jewish neighborhoods, with trucks and wiped off the walls of Palestinian flags that we have there. They broke into his house and stole their careers. And nobody speaks about it. What do they speak about? That the Palestinian people don't want to accept this loving peace. What did one of our great rabbis say? Rabbi Dom of blessed memory of England, who was a Holocaust survivor. He said, yes, they want peace. They want a peaceful occupation. We don't want that peace. We cannot sleep peacefully if we occupy. It's a rebellion against God, we cry. The world now will have another reason to vilify the Palestinians. They're giving, they've been given such a great deal. People don't understand. They don't hear what's happening. Prisoners are being given a better diet. Please. Hear our voices. This is not a peace. This is an ongoing subjugation of the Palestinians and the Jews. Another reason of the endless river of bloodshed of Palestinians and an exacerbation of anti-Semitism because people equate us religious Jews with the villainous actions of the Zionists. We are not Zionists. Judaism, because we are Jews, refuse to accept the Zionist occupation of Palestine in even one centimeter, one inch. And the solution
devotion will be, we pray. We ask everybody of you, let us pray to God with his compassion that he should bring soon because invariably, it says in the Torah, if you rebel against God, it will not be successful. The occupation will end. Let us pray he should with his compassion to bring a speedy and a peaceful end to the occupation. And then it could naturally we'd be able to live together in harmony with the free Palestine and the Palestinian rule peacefully side by side as history shows in the test. God should help. Let us pray and not be intimidated. You are not anti-Semitic. You are to stand up and plead for the suffering Palestinians and the suffering Jews. Let us speak up. Don't be intimidated. You are not anti-Semitic. God will hear our voice and we will be able to proudly stand up and say, this is what I've done and we did your work, God. God should help sooner nowadays, inshallah, a free Palestine. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you used the phrase a moment ago, taking land from the Palestinians, which again is a problematic one for a lot of Western educated Jews and non-Jews alike. There is a, an argument, which is very much in the news right now, that there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. And there is an argument that says the lands uh, that we are talking about never belonged to anybody called Palestinians. But they are the indigenous people who they, they either left because they were um, attacked as in Deir Yassin or they ran away out of panic because they've seen what happened in Deir, in these uh, towns. And, and therefore, as a Jew, which is uh, people call human rights, we call godliness, we are forbidden to steal their land. Amongst the ultra-Orthodox Jews, there's a disagreement whether to come in with guns blazing against the Zionists or to negotiate, pay some ransom, and make deals with them. The reason why the people who are in the government are there are not because they've made peace with Zionism. They would be very offended if you were to say that. But rather, they believe that negotiation with the Zionist terrorists who terrorize Judaism, a negotiation, paying some um, ransom, dealing with them is a more effective approach than coming in with guns blazing. That's it. You know, you, you've, uh, you've touched on something, uh, well, a lot of things, but... Um, the the creation of the new Jew is something that is very much pronounced in Israel. In other words, as a secular Israeli growing up, like myself, for example, then um, you there are two populations that you hate: the Arabs and the Orthodox Jews. And it's very clear; it's very pronounced. To be a good Jew, a real Jew, you need to look like me and talk like me. All these others are either primitive or they're backward, or they're weird. And the only framework in which orthodoxy, Jewish orthodoxy is accepted is uh, this, this, this uh, new creation of, of Zionist uh, orthodoxy, Zion, you know, the settler types, the Rabbi Cook, uh, B'nai Akiva, that kind of, that stream. And, and whatever, whatever, you know, orthodox Jews decided to become Zionist. That is the only one. And the hatred is, is severe. In other words, the things that you describe and to most people, and I'm reading some of the chats, you know, it's shocking that Zionists would talk uh, and describe Jews in such an anti-Semitic way. But I, I, I remember hearing it all the time. There's nothing surprising to that because growing up in Israel, that's what you, that's how you look at them, and all kinds of derogatory terms that you use to describe them. <laughs> You have the Star of David tattooed on your face. I'm trying to keep it as kosher as I can, you know. What do you make of uh, the Orthodox Jews? I feel that every person has a right to express himself. Seeing the Orthodox community coming here to explain their destruction of the State of Israel. At the end of the day, they are traitors, and I don't see truth for asking lies. Israel! 
Israel, you have no right to Palestine. So there are ultra-Orthodox Jews standing holding Palestinian flags. What do you make of that? They're Naturae Carta. But the same as ISIS, really, in religion. They're not considered amongst the Jews to be Jews, because they take it to such an extent. They go beyond normality. I mean, if they could, they would strap bombs around themselves and blow each other up. Palestine is an Israel free zone. When I spoke to people Palestine on the other side Israel of the street, they were calling you guys Palestine extremists. They can call whatever they want. Everybody can say if anybody he's an extremist. Everybody can say that. They compared you to people who would happily strap bombs on themselves, which I thought was quite interesting. Okay. Nobody here, nobody but these protests are coming out with support or um, violence. Okay. No. We do what we need to do. We know God runs the world and God has advised us what, what's our duty to do. How can you be against Israel? I went to the army. You went to the army? I went to the army and I lost people there. You lost people for nothing? No, why I lost for nothing? For a country that's your country. No, we are not, we are not willing to die for a country which is forbidden according to the Jewish people. You are unbelievable. Mashiach is not going to come for you guys. So Mashiach is going to come for you? No, yeah? you know, you know we're Jewish at all. You're Jewish. Yes, we're Jewish. We're not allowed to be Jewish. We can't be Jewish. The illegal occupation is not supported by Jews. There is no occupation. Read your facts. Like I said, in, in, in Israeli society and, and even, you know, in, in secular Israeli families, the hatred, to, to, hate the, to, to hate the Jews, to hate the Orthodox is, is, is something that's respected, you know, something that you, bra that, you, that you brag about, you know. And mind you, um, we will show you with God's help that they're, doing, they're, they're brutally beating the Jewish inhabitants who are, nobody can accuse us of being armed or militant. And yet, they, they, you can see that the Jews are brutally beaten simply because they're standing in Palestine, because there's masses, tens of thousands of Jews uh, who stand out and demonstrate, and they get brutally beaten because they're opposing the existence of the state, and they want the world to know. They get brutally beaten by, by the Israeli the, state. By the Israeli, by, yeah. Here's a, I mean, anybody can see it on our site and links, but you can just see. And simply, they're standing there, non militant we never carry arms, um, and, and this is what happens. The Zionists hate the anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews. We are traitors to the Jewish people. We are, because you see in Zionism today, as much as Zionism claims to be connected to Judaism, you can be an atheist, deny God, it's not a problem. You're a good Jew if you're a Zionist. You could not keep any of the, the, the Torah and you're still a good Jew. But if you don't appreciate Israel, then that is the cardinal sin. Zionism has replaced Judaism in terms of what's important to Jews. And that's exactly what they wanted to do. The Zionists, who, who, who literally many of them would love to kill me, and I know that because they say so. The most harmful place for Jews are in Israel. The Uniform Group accuses officials in Israel and Jerusalem of oppressing Torah Jews and recently unleashing brutal attacks on the anti-Zionists living there. Religious Jews are suffering from brutalizing from the police department. In this case, those belonging to the same religion couldn't be more divided on their belief. Whatever their banners say is just a front, it's a facade. But these people are inherently anti-Israel. They say the creation of Israel completely conflicts with the traditional teachings of Judaism. Jews are not to, are not to be the government. The government should be anybody, not, not Jewish people are not, to, are not allowed to have a government for the Messiah. But I have an addendum to that, and my addendum is that there are many Zionists in this country and many Zionist organizations who also um, refer to Jews who are not Orthodox, but Jews who are anti-Zionist, and they refer to those Jews in the most negative ways, calling them anti-Semitic. If Sanders gets the nomination, I will actively campaign against him. I will follow him from state to state, urging Americans to vote against him. Why? The man went to England 
and endorsed Jeremy Corbyn for the prime ministership. That, for me, was a red line. Jeremy Corbyn is one of the men who has most promoted and tolerated anti-Semitism in England and in Europe. Our party is united in condemning the shooting of hundreds of unarmed demonstrators in Gaza by Israeli forces and the passing of Israel's discriminatory nation-state law. The continuing occupation... <laughs> the expansion of illegal settlements and the imprisonment of Palestinian children are an outrage. I sure hope that Sanders doesn't get the nomination, because if he does, I have him in my, you know, I'm, I'm going to be there uh, pointing out what he has done over the years. What is going on in the Middle East right now is obviously a tragedy. There's no question about it. The sight of Israeli soldiers breaking the arms and legs of Arabs is reprehensible. The idea of Israel closing down towns and sealing them up is unacceptable. If elected Senator Sanders, you would be America's first Jewish president. You recently called a very prominent, well-known American-Israel lobby a platform for, quote, bigotry. What would you say to American Jews who might be concerned you're not, from their perspective, supportive enough of Israel, and specifically, sir, would you move the U.S. Embassy back to Tel Aviv? I am very proud of being Jewish. I actually lived in Israel for some months. But what I happen to believe is that right now, sadly, tragically, in Israel, through Bibi Netanyahu, you have a reactionary racist who is now running that country. And I happen to believe, I happen to believe that what our foreign policy in the Mideast should be about is absolutely protecting the independence and security of Israel. But you cannot ignore the suffering of the Palestinian people. We have got to have a policy that reaches out to the Palestinians and the American people. I've, I've interviewed Bernie Sanders many times. I've never heard him make an anti-Semitic comment. And then, oh, I, Alan, he's Jewish. I, uh, that, so is Norman Finkelstein. So is Noam Chomsky. So is um, Gilad Atzmon, some of the worst people in terms of not promoting Jewish values are, are Jews. That's no excuse. Uh, Karl Marx was a a Jew, at least a Jew uh, by heritage. So that's no excuse. I sure. Mean, I'm an example of that. Sure. And, and Orthodox Jews, look at this. Uh, aside from everything I said, I didn't even mention like religious reasons to be against Israel. The, the existence of Israel is against Judaic law. We're not allowed to have a state. But, but a, even those Jews, th there was a, you know, Deborah Lipstadt, who considers herself a big expert on on anti-Semitism, self-anointed, self-appointed. I, I was listening to a podcast that she did with Peter Beinert, right, who today is being accused of anti-Semitism, ironically. Anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. Our next debater will be making his opening statement against the resolution. Please welcome Peter Beinart, author of The Crisis of Zionism. Peter Beinart. I want to start by talking about how it hurts Jews. The number of Jews who oppose Zionism is, is not marginal as Brett suggests. The Satmar Hasidim held an anti-Zionist rally in 2017 of 20,000 people. That's larger than APAC's annual conference. Two-thirds of ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel, the fastest growing Jewish population in both Israel and the American Jewish community, reject Zionism. And the growing, no, the number of progressive American Jews who reject Zionism is growing too. When you ask American Jews in polls if the two-state solution is dead, would you prefer one state in which millions of West Bank Palestinians lack basic rights or one equal state that is not a Jewish state? A majority of American Jews favor the one equal option that is not a Jewish state, the anti-Zionist option. If you vote yes on this resolution, you are calling those Jews anti-Semites. And if you think this doesn't matter, I would note that over the last two years, a Jewish teacher has been fired and another forced to resign at New York high schools because they expressed anti-Zionist views. That's where this resolution leads. In the name of fighting anti-Semitism, Jews are denied free speech and lose their jobs. But it's not just Jews who this resolution unfairly smears as anti-Semites. Many non-Jewish anti-Zionists are anti aren't anti-Semites either. We have data on which Americans hold anti-Semitic beliefs. 
The Anti-Defamation League periodically asks Americans whether Jews have too much power, Jews are dishonest in business. And its studies show that the Americans who hold these anti-Semitic beliefs are disproportionately older and poorly educated. But when you ask which Americans have anti-Zionist beliefs, as the Pew Research Center has, it's demographically the opposite. Anti-Zionist Americans are disproportionately well-educated and young. In other words, a lot of Americans are anti-Zionists without being anti-Semites. And a lot of Americans are both Zionists and anti-Semites. That might sound strange, but it's not. Theodore Herzl himself wrote in his diaries that, quote, the anti-Semites will become our most dependable friends. I am a Zionist. But let's be honest about the reality that we face today. The Israeli government, with the support of the American government, is on the verge of annexing parts of the West Bank. The Israeli government has just announced it's about to build an E1, which people have for years said would make the viability of a Palestinian state impossible. So, and this is being done with the acquiescence, if not active, support of the organized American Jewish community. So what you're essentially telling Palestinians is the two, you will not have your own state. It's becoming more and more utterly unrealistic to imagine it. And what you are demanding, we're demanding you ask, rather than asking for equality in one state, you have to accept permanent non-citizenship under military law without the right to vote for the government that, that, that controls your lives. And if you oppose that, then you're a bigot. That's the Orwellian logic that's being put forth by this resolution. Uh, there are also Zionists who are anti-Semites. If you look at the, the most bloody, violent anti-Semitism in the United States in recent years, it's mostly come from white nationalists, many of whom lead, whose leaders actually think Israel is pretty great. Right, Richard Spencer, the most important white nationalist leader in America, called himself a, 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 a kind of a white Zionist. You could say that I am a white Zionist in the sense that I, I care about my people. I want us to have a secure homeland. You realize how f***ing insane this is, right? What you have here is a actual Nazi using the state of Israel, which was created in the wake of Nazi atrocities, as a model for a white ethno state. Uh... Why does Israel get to remain Jewish in character, culture, demographically, and so on, but America has to be subject to mass migration, has to be subject to rapid demographic replacement and change? And but now the federal government is redefining it to say, no, no, Judaism is an, a nationality, is an ethnicity, you know, making Israel an ethno state. And if Jews are white, if you're following the logic, that would make Israel a white nationalist nation, the only one that exists in the world. Right? So, the, the, the anti Semitism is, as Brett rightly said, uh, a complex phenomenon that can take many, many shapes. I am the world's proudest Jewish Nazi. Shalom, uh, Harry, listen, let me tell you something, yeah? If there was a war tomorrow, which there will be, because I'll probably start at the end of this session. If there was a war and it kicked off, I would be there on the front line fighting for Israel. Do you know why? Why not? Why not? It's like Selby, who has some on and makes dad's come up to me earlier talking about Selby, but... Oh yeah, but you yeah, so it ranges so f off, you know what I mean? Palestine. F Palestine. Why would you support Palestine? Why would someone who hates Jews support Israel? Well, there's lots of reasons. Let's start with Steve Bannon. I'm proud to be a Christian Zionist. That's why I'm proud to be a partner to one of the greatest nations on earth and the foundation of the Judeo-Christian West. You see, Bannon sees Israel as a natural ally in his racist war between Islam and the Judeo-Christian West. Which is code for white European society. It's not that Bannon loves the Jews, it's just that he doesn't hate us as much as he hates the Muslims. He is so sweet. You know, like the way antifreeze is sweet. Also, evangelical Christians, they're some of the biggest supporters of Israel in the United States, but not because they love Jews. They support Israel because of a prophecy that says all Jews must return to Israel in order for Christ to return and commence the end times. Israel has been reborn as a country. Jews are returning back to the Holy Land after centuries of exile. 
That's exciting. And those are end times prophecies. If you're a believer in, in Jesus, you will go up you, you, the, the um, rapture. rapture. The Jewish people, it's still a mystery how God's going to work all that. Ooh, it seems like the fate of the Jews is within the mystery box. Let's see what's in it. Two thirds of them are going to die. That one third that's left at the end is going to finally come to the end of themselves. It's not going to be through a process of education. It's going to be a, through a process of a horrible holocaust. Tie, 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 tie. So basically Christian Zionism is a plot to get all Jews together in Israel so that it triggers a Jewish genocide. And the smattering of Jews left after that will get to choose between Christianity or hell. Uh, a complex phenomenon that can take many, many shapes, but the data the data suggests, actually, that the Venn diagram in the United States between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism doesn't match very much at all, because the people that, we're, that are anti-Zionist in the United States are young and well-educated, and the people who give the most anti-Semitic answers to the classic questions designed by the Anti-Defamation League to measure anti-Semitism tend to be demographically opposite. They are poorly educated and old. They keep talking about some mythical Palestinian state that's going, to be, that's going to emerge, right? I have been screaming at the top of my lungs for years and years that the policies of this Israeli government are destroying the possibility of a Palestinian, of a Palestinian state. And now it's virtually the last nail is in the ground. Annexation is on the horizon. The building is happening in E1. So what's used as this mythical vision of, yes, we could support Palestinian rights one day in some state that is being destroyed as we speak, that has almost no chance of being realized now, is used as a justification for the present one-state reality in which millions of Palestinians live with fewer rights than an African-American in Mississippi in the 1950s, not even citizens of the state in which they live. And that's the position that's considered the non-bigoted position, to consider the position that you want to sustain that permanently. And for those, for the last one, for those who think that it is maybe dangerous for Jews to live with inequality with Palestinians. And there may be dangers. I want to point out that there are also profound dangers, profound dangers to Jews living alongside 50% of the fellow people between the river and the sea who have no rights. How is that going to land? There, there's a potential cholera right, Peter, outbreak I, in Gaza that would spread to Ashkelon. Peter, I have to, not I, in the Peter, I have to, I, I need you to, I need you to yield. Um, he asked her, uh, she said, anyone who's against Israel is an anti-Semite, so uh, it, it, it's existence. And he, she, he asked her, what about the Orthodox Jews who are against Israel's existence on religious grounds? So she said, the jury's out on that. Whether I'm an anti-Semite, the jury's are out on that, okay? I uh, said, maybe they're an exception, maybe not, whatever, but the jury's out on that. But the, uh, the argument that you have made yes. will be interpreted by the majority of people reading English language newspapers, watching English language television, as being prima facie anti-Semitic. How does that make you feel that what you believe to be right. a, a true representation of your religion is being portrayed in the media as actually being completely contrary to that? Yeah, well, that's, that's part of the tragedy that the media has been, unfortunately, we feel, um, some times owned and sometimes um, intimidated in a large manner by Zionism, in which they have media watch, just like they have APAC that affects politicians, are fearful of speaking against the Zionist actions or whatever they do because they're labeled anti-Semitic. So this is nuts. Who's this is the like, who's they who's literally the hijacked Jewish identity. They're crazy. He might say that about anti-Zionist Jews in the United States who are not Orthodox as well. Yes, they may. But I'm talking about somebody who even politically may not even be against Israel's politics, may, may not be involved. They say, look, I am not involved with Israel's politics. All I know is one thing. I'm a religious Jew. According to Judaism, we're supposed to live all over the world, and we're not a nationality. We're not supposed to have a state. That's all. It has nothing to do with politics or, or Palestinians or anything. Even for that alone, the jury is out whether you're an anti-Semite. So let me just paraphrase, if I could, what you've told us so far. The state of Israel has no legitimacy. It shouldn't exist at all. Sure. The Jews are responsible for rivers of blood, as you put it, in uh, the Palestinian lands. That uh, the Holocaust uh, is no, not sufficient reason to override uh, the basic Jewish premise that the Jews should not have a land of their own. Um, be, if yeah. I mean, if I, I may not, I may not have quoted you entirely accurately, but even if if someone like me were to even hint at thinking like that. 
I would be branded anti-Semitic. I would be um, vilified Again, in the mainstream media. Yes, so, so, the, so the question is, are you anti-Semitic? So, gentlemen, you know, it's it's um, we, we uh, I think what we're facing is this massive propaganda, which Norton you're talking about, which 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 goes out to delegitimize non-Orthodox Jews who are anti-Zionist and the Orthodox Jews who are anti-Zionist or anybody that does not really follow the narrative, the right narrative, which is the Zionist narrative, which goes directly from you know King David to the Maccabees, to Bar Kokhba, to uh, Ben Gurion, to today. You know, that is the narrative. That is the, that's, that's the, that's what we should be following. And anybody who dares to question that or dares to question that legitimacy presents a problem and therefore needs to be destroyed. And, and they know very, very well that the narrative is everything. For them, the narrative is the Holy Grail. If, if they lose the, the fight for the narrative, then they lose their legitimacy. And when people stop believing the narrative, then it's a slippery slope. And then, of course, there's no legitimacy. And if there's no legitimacy, then that's the end of that story. And, of course, we know that there's no legitimacy because how could there possibly be a legitimacy to calling yourself Jewish when you actually do everything you possibly can to undermine real Jewish identity or the Jewish identity as is described by Orthodox Jews, number one, and at the same time, reject Jews who are not Orthodox but reject Zionism. Uh, Abba Evan, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, uh, in an article that he wrote about 45 years ago, which I urge you to read, uh, which appeared in an American Jewish journal, Congress Weekly, a major journal of the more liberal wing of the American Jewish community. He wrote an interesting article in which he, dis he was then UN ambassador from the state of Israel. He advised the American Jewish community that they had uh, two tasks to perform. One task was to show that criticism of the policy, what he called anti-Zionism, that means actually criticisms of the policy of the state of Israel were anti-Semitism. That's the first task. Second task, if the criticism was made by Jews, their task was to show that it's neurotic self-hatred needs psychiatric treatment. And he gave two examples of the latter, latter category. One was I have stone, the other was me. So we have to be treated for our psychiatric disorders and non-Jews have to be condemned for anti-Semitism if they're critical of the state of Israel. We see this beginning in the 1970s as an explicit strategy at the time spearheaded by uh, the Israeli politician uh, Abba Ibn, who was a foreign minister, and before that, the United Nations representative of Israel, who insisted and, and gave a speech in the early 70s, insisting that, in fact, we must equate Zionism with Jewishness and Jews, and that any opposition to Zionism should be cast in the frame of anti-Semitism. We've known since last March that Israel has its own travel ban. Now we know who precisely that ban impacts. The Israeli government released the names of 20 global organizations whose members will be barred from entering the country because they support BDS, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement against Israel that is led by Palestinians. One group sticks out for being the only exclusively Jewish organization on the list. That's Jewish Voice for Peace, or JVP a left-wing American organization that is pro-BDS. It aims to pressure Israel to reverse many of its long-standing policies affecting Palestinians by calling for cultural, economic, and academic boycotts against it. Many of us think of ourselves as part of a religion, as part of the people, as part of the drug history, as part of the drug culture, but don't want to be represented by a state. Rebecca Vilcomerson is the executive director of JVP. Like executives of the other organizations on the list, she'll soon be barred from the country. Her situation is complicated by the fact that her husband and children are Israeli. The democratic norms have eroded enormously in Israel. The understanding that there's suddenly litmus tests, not just for other people, but also for Jews, about who can be involved. There's helping so many people see what's actually happening. The blacklist, which will take effect in March, applies to those who hold senior positions within the blacklisted groups. Five other American groups are on the list, as well as organizations from Europe, Chile, and South Africa. 
Finkelstein lost his job at the university because of what he claims was pressure from the Israeli lobby. Then he was denied entry to Israel because he was, as the authorities described, a security hazard, which being Jewish himself is probably unprecedented. Finkelstein reminds me of the biblical prophets of doom, who were always being pelted with stones for saying things nobody wanted to hear. One of the major kind of uh, um, claims I, I, I hear from people like the ADL or you know other Jewish people is that like, how come always picking people picking up on Israel? How come there are so much you know injustice mm -hmm. you know in other parts of the world and nobody speaks about you know? Mm -hmm. what, what is the reason I for that? I think people listen. I open the radio. I hear nonstop about Sudan. I hear nonstop about Tibet. I hear nonstop about Darfur. I hear a lot. The only place I hear excuses made for is Israel. That's the place where I hear excuses. And we do have to remember, it is the oldest occupation in the world. I mean, 40 years really is enough. It's older than you. It's older than you, the occupation. Doesn't that kind of stun you? The irony is that the Nazi Holocaust has now become the main ideological weapon for launching wars of aggression. Iran's supreme leader is the new Hitler of the Middle East. Obviously, there are some important differences between Nazi Germany and the Islamic Republic of Iran. But both regimes do have two important things in common. One, a ruthless commitment to impose tyranny and terror, and second, a ruthless commitment to murder Jews. Every time you want to launch a war of aggression, drag in the Nazi Holocaust. It's the suffering then used as another pretext or excuse to humiliate, degrade, and torture the Palestinians. That's the problem. The suffering comes as a package. It then comes, here is the suffering, now we blow up your house. Here is the suffering, now we take your land. Here is the suffering, now we drop artillery shells or shoot artillery shells at your villages. It's a package deal with Israel and its American supporters. It's not just suffering, it's suffering which is then wrapped in a club. And the club is then used to break the skulls of the Palestinians. That's the problem. Well, I think, of course, uh, Israel has always uh, used all kinds of arguments to justify many of its crimes against the Palestinian people, incle including its illegal occupation of the West Bank or Gaza or of the Syrian Golan Heights or even parts of southern Lebanon, historically. And um, it used the history of the oppression of Jews in Europe. Uh, often uh, historically and as it does today, to justify uh, many of its crimes. And I think um, Netanyahu's projected uh, steps to be taken, I think, um, in the next few days, on the occasion of uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, to attack and sanction the International Criminal Court for daring to investigate Israel's war crimes, um, a decision the ICC made in December, uh, to use this occasion to actually rally support for Israel to condemn and sanction the ICC for daring to question uh, Israeli war crimes that it has decided to investigate. I think um, makes a farce of this uh, horrifying tragedy that is being commemorated uh, uh, this year. So, however, this is hardly new for the Israelis. Um, my understanding also from the Israeli press is that Netanyahu is seeking to impose on world leaders the adoption of the new definition by the International Alliance, the International Holocaust um, uh, Remembrance Alliance, which has recently, in its definition of anti Semitism, included any criticism of the state of Israel or Zionism. So, in many ways, this is reframing the meaning of Zionism as collapsing it into Judaism and Jewishness, something which, of course, the majority of Jews historically have opposed. Um, as uh, uh, you know, history shows us, the majority of Jews, since the beginning uh, of the rise of Zionism at the end of the 19th century, have opposed this movement. 
So to use this occasion today, I think, to uh, try to impose sort of Israel's will to whitewash its crimes rather than seeing this occasion as the instance um, uh, that should remind us all that criminals, those who commit war crimes, those who commit wars of aggression, um, should be opposed, that should be brought to justice, um, is, uh, I think, quite ironic. All right, let's go on. Next. Okay, this one's from Ahmed. Uh, the question is, I've always thought settlers were either opportunists or religious fanatics. Is that accurate to say? Are Orthodox Jews part of the settler community? We're following our hearts. What we should be doing is all written in the Bible. We just read it in our weekly Torah portion. Expel the Arabs, kick them out. Disputes between the radical settlers and their Palestinian neighbors are constant. The radical settlers have weapons and military training. They believe that if they could do things their way, everything would be different. The radicals claim an exclusive right to the land and everything that grows here. It's a message they're getting across to their neighbors, the Palestinian farmers, often with violence. There are certain conditions, according to Jewish law, under which non-Jews may live here. This doesn't apply to the Arabs. They don't fit the category. They have to get the hell out. Whoever leaves under his own steam will save his own life. Whoever doesn't will have to pay the price. This is the land of Israel. It's their pattern from Europe. And then war comes. And they take the land that belonged to the Palestinians, and they give it a divine backing, of course. We, we, we are the children of Israel. We are the people of God. And, and they sell you the story that if you're kind to the children of Israel, God will be kind to you. I want to tell you the truth of that tonight. All, all, you know, all Israelis are settlers. I mean, my, parent, my grandparents were settlers. They came from the same nationalistic fanaticism that you're talking about, except they did not have the religion. They throw away religion. They said, we're just a nation. But that is what fueled their ability to throw out people from their homes, burn their villages, and take over the land and take their homes, or the ones that they didn't burn. So in other words, that, ex that, that definition ex expands and is appropriate not only for these West Bank uh, fanatics that we're talking about right now, uh, but it, it's true for all Israelis and settle, you know, people talk about se illegal settlements. There are no settlements that are legal anywhere. Tel Aviv is not a legal settlement. It sits on the, dis on, on the dis destroyed neighborhoods and uh, 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 Palestinian neighborhoods of Yaffa and other and towns and villages that have been built on you know, Tel Aviv University and the beach and everything. You go there, it's like a graveyard, you know, you're like you're walking on a graveyard. Uh -huh. So there are no legitimate legal settlements anywhere in what is considered the state of Israel. And all Israelis are, are settlers, illegal settlers. And, and I agree with what you said exactly. It's just that the settlers, the early settlers did not have the religion. They only had the nationality. The later ones put on a kippah and the, and the tzitzis and they walk around and, and, and they said that they, they combined the, these two things. The, the only difference between the settlers and the secular Zionists is that the settlers believe that nationalism is part of their religion, of Zionism. But Zionism is really the religion they're practicing, even though they call it Judaism, you know? It's like supersessionism. Uh, to me, Zionism is the, is, is the ideology that, say, that, uh, that says that all Jews are a nation, their country is Palestine, and the Old Testament is their history. And that kind of legitimizes what Zionists have done and what Israel has done, which is kick out Palestinians, take their place and say, this is our land, our homeland, our country. I threw rocks on um, Arabs' car. I don't think I did something bad. So you don't think throwing rocks at, at Arabs is a bad thing to do? Jews should live here. Uh, we need to bring them out of here. But can you, I mean, can you see it from their perspective of some of them have lived here for generations, how they might feel like this land belongs to them? I don't care. I mean, according to the Torah, this is Eretz Israel. It belongs to us. 
I mean, you don't think there's any way that Arabs and Jews can live here in peace? No. They don't have the right to stay here. Goy ve Yehudi asur lehem leichol afilu al ato shulchan. Anachu lomdim kacha meatarbut araa shelaim ve... It's all, it's all according to, to him. I don't care anything else. This is all You don't care matters. about laws, you don't care about like human rights or any of that. It's all according to the Torah. The Torah has also human rights. Mm -hmm. The real human rights. And somebody said this recently, I think it was Israeli ambassador to the UN or something, he just said it again. You know, this is our deed. You know, the, 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 the Old Testament, the Bible is our deed. Of course, we say it's our land. The Torah says it. But they don't believe in the Torah. So, that's the reason there is not peace. That's what Zionism, that's what Zionism is, and, you know, we see the settler colonialism, the racism, the apartheid that it brought about, so, therefore, it has to be rejected. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Rima. The question is, would you say there are parallels between the supremacist, segregationist nature of national Judaism and white nationalists? I, I would say there is, absolutely. I think racism, racism is racism and supremacy is supremacy and uh, fascism is fascism. The fact that these yep. guys tend to be Jews doesn't, um, I don't think it makes it any difference. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, Zionism is much more uh, supremacist than white nationalism. Ben Ari is known for leading nationalist marches through Arab neighborhoods inside Israel where he antagonizes, intimidates, and menaces Arab citizens. Israel is ethnically cleansing the Palestinian people because it must. Because their entire thesis is that Palestine was a land without people, which should be taken by them who were a people without land. And that gigantic lie, one of the biggest lies in all human history, is so obviously untrue once you get there. Even then, when the Zionist settlers began to arrive and the Zionist movement began to pick up pace, well over 90% of the population of Palestine were Arab, Muslim and Christian. There were some Jews there who had lived there for centuries in peace, side by side with the Muslims and the Christians. There had been always a smallish number of religious Jews living in Jerusalem in peace with all the others. But Zionism began to pick up steam. It arrived there and it found that this was not a land without a people. There were plenty of people. And they all saw themselves as Palestinian first and as Arab second. And this was an existential challenge to Zionism. That's why hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, 800,000, were driven from Palestine into refugee camps in what we call the Nakba, the catastrophe. And those 800,000 have now become many, many millions. 1948 to 2016, the high birth rate of the Palestinian people has become millions. There are maybe 13 or 14 million Palestinians now uh, alive in the world who consider themselves to be Palestinians and they still have the key and the title deed to the land that was uh, stolen from them. Uh, so ethnic cleansing is the only way to solve this. In, in today's world you couldn't even if they wanted to murder all the Palestinians still there in Gaza and the West Bank and inside what's called the Green Line the original 1948 UN delineated border, there are maybe 7 million Palestinians. You cannot murder them all. So what's the only thing you can do is to drive them out. And there are many sections of the Zionist population uh, and political organizations and leaders 
who are endlessly coming up with new ways to drive these people out. You make life as bad for them as you possibly can and hope that they will take off somewhere else and disappear. The problem for them is the Palestinian people, far from disappearing, are more visible today than they have ever been, more numerous than they were before, more indispensable to any solution in the area than ever before, and they're not going to go away. Arafat used to say, we are not going to go into the museum of X nations so that people can come and look at our clothes and our cooking uh, utensils and our artifacts. We will not go into the museum of X nations. And that's definitely true. Yeah, we want the world to go forth right now that we love the brothers and sisters in Gaza! We're here in the deep, deep love for our precious Palestinian brothers and sisters who are undergoing not just occupation, not just domination, not just humiliation, but more and more every day, annihilation, and we won't stand for it. We won't stand one minute for it. I come to you in the spirit of the love supreme of John Coltrane and the spirit of Edward Zaid, my dear brother who tried to tell the truth a long time ago, and we know the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Just like we have an unapologetic love for those who are wrestling with unbelievable hellish and nightmarish conditions under occupation, we want an end to occupation now! And I come to you also in the spirit of the black prophetic tradition of Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Ida Wee Wells, Barnett, Ella Baker, and others, and they say what? They say Benjamin Netanyahu is a war criminal not because he's Jewish, but because he has chosen to promote occupation and annihilation. This is a human affair. Any human being who chooses Occupation and annihilation is a war criminal, and especially when they're killing precious Palestinian babies. A Palestinian baby has exactly the same status as a white baby in Newtown, Connecticut, as a brown baby in the east side of L.A. As a Jewish baby in Israel, every human being is made in the image of God. And we want the world to know that and know it well because we know the history of Nakba. We know the history of the catastrophe. We know the history of the 750,000 precious Arabs who were pushed out of 416 villages. We want that story to be told. Let's tell the truth. But let's tell the truth in such a way that we're honest and open. No anti-Jewish hatred here, anti-occupation here, anti-annihilation of anybody here. This is a universal affair, but it begins with our precious Palestinian brothers and sisters whose humanity is rendered invisible in the corporate media, whose humanity is rendered invisible in the stories told. We want to shatter all the lies there's an intimate connection between mendacity and criminality. Between lies and crimes against humanity. And what I want to say to my black brother in the White House. Barack Obama is a war criminal not because he's black or half African or white, but because his drones have killed 233 innocent children and because he facilitates the killing of innocent Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, and that would be true anywhere else. There you go. And I'm going to be honest with you before I sit down. Okay. <laughs> that I would be here if there were a Palestinian occupation of Jewish brothers and sisters. 
Because it's wrong, it's unjust. And we stand not with the level of skin pigmentation or ethnic identity. This is ethical, this is spiritual with political consequences. And that's why we do acknowledge the need for resistance under conditions of occupation and annihilation. And the killing of any innocent civilian is a war crime. But we're now 1,600 and counting. That is what? That is Israeli state terrorism in action. And it's Jewish racism in motion. But it, it does not speak on behalf of all the Jewish brothers and sisters who have a choice to say, we're against occupation, we're against annihilation, 